Today we're going to start chapter uh, 5, sections 1 through 6, on force and motion. This is going to be the first of two chapters that we're covering on force. Um, in the first chapter, we're just going to cover the basics. All right, so let's talk about all the concepts first. Um, so the study of the relationship between force and acceleration of a body is called Newtonian mechanics. All right, so that's basically what um, most of this course is going to be covering, Newtonian mechanics. Um, so Newtonian mechanics does not hold uh, good for all situations. So examples of some situations that don't uh, work for Newtonian mechanics are either relativistic or near relativistic motion. Um, and then motion of atomic scale. So either something that's going you know, really fast in relativistic motion or uh, something really small down to the molecular or atom sized uh, particles. Okay, so let's first talk about um, a few laws. So Newton, Newton developed uh, multiple laws of motion and the first three we're gonna um, start discussing we're talking about forces. So Newton's first law is, if no force acts on a body, the body's velocity cannot change. That is, the body cannot accelerate. So another way of saying this is, if a body is at rest, it stays at rest. And if a body is moving, it's going to continue moving with the same velocity, meaning same direction, same magnitude. Um, and then we can add to this and say, unless acted upon by an outside force. So unless acted on by an outside force. Okay. A force is measured by the acceleration that it that it produces. So we measure measure forces um, by looking at the acceleration. So that means there's going to be some relationship between force and acceleration. Forces uh, have both magnitudes and directions, so forces are going to be vectors. We'll write it as big F with the vector symbol over it. When two or more forces act on a body, we can find their net or the resultant force by adding all the individual forces vectorally. So if I had um, you know, this force and this force and this force, we can just add all these vectors together to find what the net force on the object is, and that'll help us figure out where um, the acceleration is heading. So the net force acting on a body is represented by the vector symbol F net. So um, they give you this option of writing the net force, which is again is the sum of all the forces acting on the object. Um, but another way you can also write it is the summation of forces. So this is just um, the summation symbol. Uh, in capital epsilon, and then you know F. So the summation of forces or um, net forces. We're going to use those synonymously in this chapter. All right, so just again, restating Newton's first law: if no net force acts on a body, no net force. So if there's a all the forces that act on a body add up to zero, the body's velocity cannot change. That is, the body cannot accelerate. So it's either going to stay at rest or continue moving in the same direction at the same velocity. All right, um, so let's talk about the unit real quickly for force. So f a force that is exerted on a standard mass of one kilogram to produce an acceleration of one meters a second is going to have a magnitude of one newton. Therefore, one newton is going to be equal to one kilogram that's moving at one meters a second. All right, so a newton is basically kilogram meters divided by second squared. All right, so an inertial reference frame is one in which Newton's laws hold, all right, so that we can use Newton's laws in. So let's think about a situation. If a puck is sent sliding along a short strip of frictionless ice, the puck's motion obeys Newton's laws, as observed from the Earth's surface. If you're on the Earth's surface, you can you see that the that the puck is going in a straight line. If you're if you're covering a short distance, now in picture A here, it's showing the path of a puck sliding from the North Pole as seen from a stationary point in space. So if I was in space, I would see that the Earth is rotating, but if the puck went straight down like that, so the situation is if if a puck is sent sliding along a long ice strip extending from the North Pole, and if it is viewed from a point on the Earth's surface, the 
the puck's path is not going to be a straight line. So if you notice in the second picture, the path of the puck as seen from the ground, you're actually going to see this curve. So this is going to be a non-inertial frame um, because it's not going to be a Bayes Newton's first um, Newton's laws because we, we see that the direction is changing, which means there's an acceleration, um, and there's no forces acting on it. So that's not going to be an inertial frame. So we call that a non-inertial uh, reference frame. Okay, so mass is an in intrinsic characteristic of, of a body. Um, the mass of a body is the characteristic that relates a force on the body to the resulting acceleration. So the ratio of masses of two bodies is equal to the inverse of the ratio of their accelerations when the same force is applied. So we come up with this ratio here. <clears throat> you have the mass of one divided by the mass of your other is equal to the acceleration of the second one divided by the acceleration of the other. Okay. So here we come to Newton's second law. Right? Newton's second law. The net force on a body is going to equal the product of the body's mass times the acceleration. So Newton's second law is simply F is equal to MA, which is the force is equal to mass times acceleration. Or we can also say net force or the summation of force is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, in component form, we can look at it this in all in all of our three dimensions. So remember in, in previous chapters we broke down the x direction and the y direction of motion into separate problems. We're going to do the same thing for the forces. So we're going to take all the forces in the x direction, that'll get, get you our x acceleration. All the forces in the y direction get you our y acceleration. And all the forces in the z direction will give you the z acceleration. So since force is a vector, we can break it down into its components in the different directions and then solve each problem separately. Now the acceleration component along a given axis is caused only by the sum of the forces um, of the force components along the same axis, not by the components along any other axis again. So the only thing that affects the x acceleration is going to be the forces in the x direction, and so on and so forth. All right, com coming back to the units again. All right, so the SI unit of force is Newton, like we said before. Again, I showed you this. It's one kilogram times one meters a second, and that's going to be equal to one Newton. Um, in other systems, you have different um, uh, different units used um, in our uh, centimeter, grams, seconds, which is uh, something we don't use very often, but the force is going to be called a dyne. Um, in the British unit, you know, these are called pounds. Um, so again, pound is actually a force. We think of, of when we measure uh, someone's weight in pounds, it's, it's the mass. Well, it's actually pounds are the force. The British unit for mass is actually called a slug, which again is something that we don't use um, very often. But a slug is uh, correlated to a kilogram and a newton correlates with a pound. So free body diagrams are something that are going to be really important when we go um, into forces. So, so what it does is it lets us visually show all the forces acting on an object. All right, so here you have one object that's sitting on a surface. You have a 5 newton force to the left, a 3 newton force to the, to, excuse me, 5 newton force to the right, 3 newton force to the left, which means the net force in this case is just going to be, if we add all the forces together, to the acceleration. All right, so if we, on the left side, we net all of our forces together, we add them all together, so we have 5 newtons minus 3 newtons, because 3 newtons is in the negative x direction, and that's equal to mass times acceleration. So you get 2 newtons is equal to ma for the equation. All right, so in a free body diagram, the only body shown is the one for which you're summing the forces. So in a problem, you might have a lot of different objects. You might have a pulley system with a couple different weights on it. Um, but when you're drawing the free body diagram, you just want to do that of one specific object. All right, so if you're looking at just one object at a time, you can draw the free body diagram for that object. Sometimes when we draw free body diagrams, we just use a dot instead of actually a box. So either a box or a dot is fine. And then you draw the force vectors always going away, right? So, or you can just draw it as a box. Oops. 
always want to draw the force vectors away. Okay. Um, now they also don't need to necessarily be on the planes themselves. You can draw free body diagrams, you know, with forces maybe at a 30 degree angle, something like that. Just depends on uh, wherever you have your forces. Now, a little later in the chapter, we're going to go into all the different kinds of forces you can have on a free body diagram. For instance, when you're looking at this situation, um, if this object has some mass, you're going to have gravity pulling down on it. So you end up with gravity, which is the weight, which is m times g, so just mass times the acceleration um, due to gravity. And then you'll also have something going up, um, which is called a normal force. But like I said, we'll get that uh, into that a little bit later in the chapter. All right, so just to finish up the couple comments here, each force on the body is going to be drawn as a vector arrow with its tail on the body. So again, you want the tail attached to the body and then the arrow going away. The coordinate system is usually included, and the acceleration of the body is sometimes shown with a vector arrow labeled as an acceleration. So for instance, if this object was accelerating and I knew what that acceleration was, um, let me just erase some of this real quick. Um, beside the free body diagram, I would draw another arrow saying that the acceleration is in some direction. Or you know, up here, I would draw the acceleration in some direction, if I knew that the object was accelerating in a, partic in a particular direction. It's just helpful to draw. Okay, so let's do an example, I'm trying to make some sense of this. Um, parts A, B, and C of the figure show three different situations in which one or two forces act on a puck that moves over frictionless ice along an x-axis in one-dimensional motion. The puck's mass is 0.2 kilograms. Forces uh, 1 and 2 are directed along the axis and have magnitudes F1 is equal to 4.0 newtons and F2 is equal to 2.0 newtons. Where force 3, F3, is directed at an angle theta is equal to 30 degrees and has a magnitude of 1 newton. In each situation, what is the acceleration of the puck? All right, so let's look at um, instance A first. So we're just looking at this one. Horizontal force causes a horizontal acceleration. So if we use our equation, the summation of forces is equal to ma, we come up with this. Um, all the forces acting in situation A are just F1, and that's equal to max because it's going along the x-axis. All right, so we can just go ahead and, if we're solving for the acceleration, uh, we'll just rearrange the equation for acceleration. Plug in our value, so F1 is 4.0 newtons, divided by 0 0.20 kilograms. And that is going to be equal to 20 meters a second squared. All right. Now since the answer is positive, it's going to indicate that the acceleration is in the positive x-axis. So it's accelerating to the right. Now in the second situation, two horizontal forces act on the puck. F1 is in the positive uh, direction of x and f2 is in the negative direction. All right, so again, using this equation up here, we sum all of our forces on the left side. So we're going to have uh, f1, which is positive, minus f2, because that's going to the left, so that'll be negative, and that's going to equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. So again, rearranging for ax, we get f1 minus f2 over our mass, so it's 4.0 newtons minus 2.0 newtons divided by 0.2 kilograms. And that'll be 10 meters a second squared. Again, it's in the positive, or it's a positive result, so you know that the object is going to be accelerating in, um, to the right. All right. In the last situation, um, F3 is not directed along the direction of the puck's acceleration, so only the x component is. Um, so we need to find the x component of this little vector right here. And we do that just like we find the x component for any other vector. Um, we just multiply the magnitude times cosine theta. All right, so when we sub, um, when we sum all of our forces, again, using our um, equation up here, we're going to sum the forces on the left side. So you're going to get 1.0 newton times the cosine of 30 degrees. Right, that gets us the x component, the x component of F3, 
and then we subtract f2 because that's going to the left oops and f2 is uh, 2.0 newtons and we divide that by the mass then we get negative 5.7 meters a second squared Notice how we end up with a negative this time, which means the object is going to be accelerating to the left in this case. Okay, that's going to be it for this lecture. We'll see you next time.